What's up, YouTube? Jason here with Jason Bites Back, episode numero 75 -o. I might sound a little sick because I either have allergies or I'm sick. Either one. If you guys are not familiar with the series, this is a series of which I go back over the last 30 days, give or take some change, and look at comments, respond, and answer questions. And yeah, they're actually pretty random. However, this episode is brought to you by my awesome YouTube members, those names of which will be listed at the end of the screen. And it's like so much harder to say. I'm used to saying Patreon. Anyways, if you guys didn't see my last video, I finally re-picked up the whole building of my Home Assistant server. It's that server, it's got old CPU in there. Uh, it's running Home Assistant right now, but I also want to run like a testing environment for Unraid. Uh, and I also really kind of want to throw a Blue Iris, like a Windows virtual machine to run Blue Iris. That way I can combine all of that into this new server that I'm building and hopefully it'll have adequate cooling and it will have the resources required to run Blue Iris and all of the AI needs that it has. And uh, yeah, that's in the works. So I tore that entire thing down. I went to repaint it. I started building it and then I got into Home Assistant and that rabbit hole got so deep so fast that now, then, it's still now, I didn't actually want to take down the server because it, I wanted it to be up all the time and I did not want to take it down to work with it because Home Assistant is addicting. But hey, I'm finally going to finish that, so I'm in the works. I got more stuff showing up today. That way I can get everything put back together and then actually probably put it in my rack. Actually, now that I think about it, I wonder if I have room in my rack. I'll have, anyway. The first question of today is from uh, V World? V, v World, anyways. Jason, what was the thing in the ESP32 board? What's it called? Well, this is called a personalized thing that was made from somebody on Discord and sent it to me. So Katz actually had a, the name Katz, had this thing printed out from somewhere to where like this could just be soldered on top of it. It's just kind of plug and play stuff really. Uh, so that's pretty cool actually. But this is custom made of personal custom design. It can be powered by the five volt or whatever. Anyways, 100% custom made here. Um, it was just sent to me for to kind of mess around with, and since I'm building this new server, I want to find a way to incorporate this into the uh, Home Assistant build, which is actually a Proxmox build with Home Assistant running on it. So I'm going to find a way to use these, and as far as I know, you cannot buy them anywhere, unless Katz wants to sell them. But I don't know. I don't know if that's a thing. Next question is from Chris in Texas. He says, I'm all for this, but you made it so complicated. Why not just use PoE to power the fans? Works well. I use it for all my ESP32s and A266s, et cetera, et cetera. Honestly, I really did not want to stress my PoE enough. I didn't know if I'd be able to get enough power draw out of just, let's say, one line. And I, I just, I haven't really gotten into the whole, like, tap a PoE line for power thing yet. So I don't really know the limitations, what you should or should not do overheating, you know, that sort of thing. To me, it was just a better logic uh, to run a sub 24 volt background, you know, power system within my house because I knew that I was gonna do like kitchen LEDs, landscaping LEDs, stuff like that, things that I'm going to want to tap into a 24 volt power supply. So uh, yes, I need a buck converter and everything to make this ESP32 in my attic right now work, but it makes more sense to just be able to run it over, plug it into that line rather than worry on uh, about anything else, like, you know, using an Ethernet line or whatever. I totally get where you're coming from, but just for my situation, I'd rather not use Ethernet lines. I'd just, uh, I'd rather tap into a nice self-sustained 24 volt system that I already have installed, or I have installed now. Erica said, look at the difference between the high and low static. Take the number with clean filter installed and double it. That is a good spot to see a filter change alarm. Yes, or to set a filter change alarm. Yes, actually, Erica, when I was working on this new project of mine, um, the HVAC monitor, if you guys aren't familiar with that, I was monitoring the static pressure, like seeing what the pressure in, pressure out, temperature in, temperature out, you know, just stuff like that. I actually had kind of a dirty filter. Um, I was looking at the numbers, it's like inches in water columns, and I found out that my filter was actually dirty because I was advised by Jay Derp off of Discord, said, hey, go remove this filter. Let's see what it looks like then. Sure enough, it was way different. So I immediately went out, bought a new filter, plugged that in, and my pressure did not double, but it went up from an average of like 0.88 inches water column 
which I'm, I don't even really know what that means, to now floating around 1.6 to 1.8. So it was a dramatic improvement and I kind of sort of have the baseline to build some alerts, which is really nice, honestly. I mean, the whole idea of this HVAC monitoring thing, I, I look at it like this, you know, if you, if you sell cars and you want the general population and not to blow their cars up due to oil or something like that, you can't, you cannot accommodate for like heat, environmental aspects like dust or, you know, whatever, whatever might cause oil to last longer or shorter in a vehicle. So the easiest way is just say, hey, 3,000, 5,000, 7,000, whatever, to just give a blanket number, right? When in reality, depending on your environment, instead of let's say every 5,000 miles you need to change your oil, maybe you actually have to change it every 3,000 miles because you live on a dirt road, you got a bunch of crap in your, what, I don't know. Filters on HVACs are kind of the same thing. They're just like, you know, every six months, you just have it on the schedule of this thing, whatever. I would rather be told, hey, I have two animals in my house. Your thing is clogged way faster than six months. And now it's costing you money every single month on your electric bill because your air conditioning unit is running way more than it should. But that's just me. I like the idea. It gives me a more real time look into my system. And once I get all the notifications and everything set up, I will actually know, hey, you're running dangerously dirty. You're dangerously dirty. That <laughs> You should probably get that fixed. So that'd be pretty cool once I get all that fine-tuned. Next question is from uh, Terran Visitor. He said, did you learn specifically why the buck converter and its different voltage solved the conversion deviation issue? I never really like technically looked into that whole sensor issue thing more after I solved it, primarily because when I looked at like things online with the SP32, you run a sensor off of the 3.3 volt, you're all good to go it's just not made to handle multiple sensors. It's not made to power that much. It is only 3.3 volts, so it's kind of realistic to understand that it's just not gonna power a bunch of things. So my solution was to have a separate power supply that offered enough power to actually power those sensors to be accurate without being thrown off due to the lack of available power. Not to mention, I was going to be pushing that voltage through a line, not a very long one, this long, give or take, but through a line, and I knew that that could also affect the power. So it was just a good idea from every angle to add a different like voltage regulator to give a little bit higher voltage and everything I needed to feed the sensors that I was trying to mess with. That way I didn't get any kind of like weird readings just because of the power was off a little bit. Next question is from James. He says, Jason, you are making me want to get Home Assistant up and running. I ain't got time for that. <laughs> James, dude, I seriously, I don't blame you. Like, Home Assistant has been a rabbit hole for me and it started dashboard integrations, custom UIs, I'm learning YAML, I'm like making my own cards for soil sensors and I mean, it is a rabbit hole and it takes a lot of time. And when you have like a, this squirrel mentality of where everything's shiny you wanna run towards and jump head first into, it's even worse, trust me. But do it because I want others to suffer as I have. So do it. Next question is from uh, Ace Boy says, I want to know how you have those garage door icons working. I tried a couple I found via Google and I've had no luck. Well, Ace Boy, you're in luck. Editing Jason will put the code right here. I hope you're pausing this or something and you can just write it all down, but there you go. So take that, put it in Home Assistant, look at all the plugins and everything in there. You're going to have to like discern what I have from that yourself, but at least you have the code that I use to make my garage door uh, opener icons move and all that other stuff. And yes, I guess I'll put the code in the description down below just to make it easy. Next question is from Torrent Fiend. He said, step away from the soil monitor. Stop fingering the soil. Funny enough, I spent $50 per one of these Zigbee soil moisture monitor things. And three of them so far are dead. And not like completely dead, like the actual, the motherboard themselves and like the temperature monitor that they have built into them, like those things, totally okay. But the little stick that comes down and goes into the ground, dead. This means that these things were not able to stay in the ground constantly for more than a few months, like four months, three or four months, without just crapping out and dying. So that was... I mean, since I do have a few of them or a couple of them working, I mean, that was like $250 just blown for these sensors that ultimately did not work. 
I'm going to try to use the housing to try to make my own. I mean, you can just take a board like this or small board, what a, you can make your own. But anyways, I'm gonna try to remake that at a later date, but it's, you know, for now, yeah, it just kind of sucks. That might've just been a failure for the rest of the year. I'm just throwing that out there. Next question. Dan has said, quite a bit happier with my Amcrest cameras, both day and night. Now, dealing with blue iris is a whole nother story. Now, this is actually the final question, so Dan, let me tell you a little something something about blue iris. Well, I mean, guess, first of all, yes, I love Amcrest. I use mostly Amcrest cameras. They've been the most reliable at, I realistically haven't had any issues with them yet, knock on wood. But when it comes to blue iris, that is a whole nother rabbit hole for me. I have been running Blue Iris for many, many years. I have a lot, a large collection of history of footage, which I am actually considering just deleting because, yeah, Blue Iris can be finicky. And some of the things that I see wrong with Blue Iris is that it maintains its entire da database through essentially just raw text files, which takes forever to manage and maintain and, and stuff like that. You have to kind of sort of understand storage options, then you're also kind of sort of limited on storage options, right? Like, it really is kind of like one of those things, like it's the best that I have found out there for the money, and I have been using it for so long, I'm always scared to switch to anything, but it definitely has its flaws. Like right now, my Blue Iris keeps freezing up windows. And I know it's Blue Iris because that Windows machine is solid, but Blue Iris itself is not very solid. So I am in the process of finishing up my new server uh, and then I'm gonna move it over to a virtual machine. I'm gonna test it that way. And I'm really kind of hoping it'll run okay in a virtual machine environment. I don't know how well it will, but I really am hoping. Blue Iris by itself is just kind of a finicky little beast and Windows is the only thing it really runs on. It, there's actually a Docker container for it, but it's not very great last I heard. So uh, yeah, one of the worst parts about running on a Windows machine is that if you have hard drives in that machine, Windows 10 at least, Windows 10 Pro, does not allow you for some reason to, to do like a RAID 5. Like you have to have a higher version of Windows to do that. So of course you have to take alternate routes to try to find you know, storage solutions, which my rabbit hole is taking me down a huge path of finding weaknesses in this whole idea, mainly because of how Blue Iris accesses the, this information, processes everything, and then causes freeze ups because of it. So, you know, hey, just throwing that out there. Blue Iris so far, as far as I know, is one of the best softwares, especially for the money, but it's gonna take some tweaking and getting used to and you might find yourself just a little frustrated. That's all. Well guys, that's it for today. As always, names listed at the end of this video. I do appreciate you guys watching. Hopefully you will enjoy the rest of the build of this black and gold home assistant server that I'm doing because now I'm actually motivated to get it finished. So thank you for tuning in, like and subscribe and have yourself a great day. Just to clarify, this is an ESP, I think an 82. Yeah, 8266. So this is a, a ESP8266. This is Wi-Fi. I like the idea of this. And when I posted the build video for that server that I was talking about, I tapped a 12 and a five volt line. I kind of wired some stuff in because I have these huge fans that I'm wiring in that uh, can draw up to 1.5 amps each. They won't, they will not run, at least not run without um, either A, causing overheating on the motherboard, potentially causing issues or B, um, they won't run at full speed. So I, if I ever actually do need them to ramp up, they just won't be able to get there. So I had to wire those separately and I have some stuff coming probably maybe now from Amazon that's going to allow me to do that. In that video, I was talking about tapping a five volt line to power this and something that Katz told me that I was immediately like, well, you know, it's not really separate for the computer. Even if you have a five volt, volt like, like, how do you know that's reliable? If that goes down, do you still have power? So I've been thinking a lot about that. When I posted that video, someone pointed out my exact original concern that I had with the concept of this, where you're essentially relying on the five volt standby voltage that comes from a computer's power supply when it's turned off. And if that for some reason is not available, then you lose your ability to control that computer, which, doesn't really make sense. And I think that just kind of reaffirmed it for me. So instead, I'm going to find a different solution for this, or at least try to, 
try to find a different solution to this and I'm probably also maybe potentially very likely going to be using an ESP32 as well. Stick with me here.